The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. Advice Intelligence is the market leader in goals-based advice technology. Offering clients an end-to-end financial planning software solution, AI unleashes the true power of advice by providing a new world of advice software to enable planners to work smarter, not harder. Delivering financial advice in a way that's inspiring, cost-effective, and scalable. AI makes it easy for advisors to have enriched and engaged conversations with clients so they can solve their problems and explore future possibilities together. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm here with James Baird. James is a Director and Principal Advisor at Just Invest based out of Dunsborough in WA. Uh, James, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me, Ben. Mate, uh, you've been at it for a while, so I'm keen to pick up some of those uh, the, the things that you've learned along the way. I thought maybe a good place to start would be if you could talk us through your journey in advice and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, I started as a BDM in the year 2000. It seems like a long time ago now. <laughs> and uh, went overseas for a couple of years to the UK and came back and, and worked as a BDM for Asgard for another few years before I joined our family business, uh, which which myself and my wife bought off her father, uh, which had actually been going for a very long time, had been operating since 1967, started as a risk insurance business and then developed into superannuation investment over, over time. So myself and my wife effectively stepped into a, a business that was um, – uh, well established, quite mature, had a bit of everything really. had had everything: corporate super, self managed super, insurance, investment, and so on. And um, it was a really good training ground to come into the industry. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and I think that you know, ultimately, relationship game, BDM stuff, uh, all down the same path. But um, obviously, a pretty different game running your own business. Essentially, like how how was that transition for you? I think as a BDM, I was always really interested in best practice and trying to help advi- advisors with uh, with that. And so you, you, you'd, you'd be on the road, you see what practices are implementing things successfully, and um, and I guess you're sharing some of those ideas. And so I, I always had that sort of I guess consultant sort of mindset, and uh, and and I think with our business, you could see it wasn't perfect. Um, but you're not going to change it overnight. So it was all about incremental improvements. And uh, I think we still see ourselves on as, as being on that journey. Mate, it never stops. It never stops, that's for sure. And that's mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that I loved about advice when uh, I first started as a as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, graduate that there's legislations changing all the time, clients changing all the time, markets changing all the time. And then you overlay that business, business conditions, technology, and all of those sorts of things. It means that there's always something to keep us occupied. I imagine that coming into a business that had been going for such a long time meant that there was probably a whole bunch of things that or ideas that you had or things that you wanted to sort of tweak or or refine. How did you tackle things in the early days in making that transition and figuring out what you would focus on and what would move the dial most? 
I think there's a couple of things. One of the things was that we implemented, started implementing fee for service, uh, you know, flat fee arrangements for clients. It must have been about 15 years ago. I'm not sure the exact date because uh, we could sort of see that these these trail commissions and you know all these volume bonuses. I, I guess there was a range of things in the industry that, that that I was sitting back saying I don't think these things are going to be in place forever. I don't think it's equitable and transparent. And sure enough, it, I mean it took a royal commission and a whole lot of regulation changes. But you know so many of those things that were intrinsic in every advice business that had been around for for decades. You know, it was all it was all cracked open and um, ripped apart and had to be rebuilt. So yeah, we we were fortunate enough to um, have put some of those things in place where where we were we were flat fee and very transparent with a, with with that. But still, we were we were on that journey, and um, yeah, it, I think all of us got affected by by those royal commission changes and um, had to had to reassess your your commissions front. You know, e- e- even if a client was was happily paying one percent, you know, our business had, had, had tried to move away from that. But if you're doing corporate super, one percent for a client could be a, they could have a fifty grand portfolio or a five hundred grand portfolio. So it's very you know very hard to crack open that pricing and reset it all. So that was a real real long term work in progress. And the other thing was, I guess myself and my wife had bought the business with a real keen interest on ethical investment. And, um, and and the, some of the legacy clients were were very much mainstream and hadn't hadn't come aboard with that overlay. So we were busy, um, I guess, promoting ourselves as an ethical investment practice and working um, pretty heavily in that area. And then um, almost re- retrospectively, going back to some of those longer term clients and saying, "Hey, um, let's go back and reassess your ethical criteria." and um, you know, do you want to invest in some funds where we can get some posit- positive impact for you? And um, a lot of the clients came along f- uh, for the journey on that on that front, and um, some of them, you know, didn't didn't change from that mainstream approach, and probably never will. Yeah, yes. Um, I think for us, I'd noticed the same thing with particularly when all of the FOFA reforms were happening. That you that was when I got into a position where I first had a bit more control over service structuring and fees and how to to charge and transparency and all those sorts of things. So um, you could see for, from my end that when they started introducing, you know, the fee disclosure statements and talking about the, the commissions and grandfathering and those sorts of things that we were headed in that direction. But I think it's um, powerful to be ahead of the curve when it comes to those things because then when when the legislation does eventually change it means that you can focus on what's next instead of just keeping up so it sounds like you were at it way way in, uh, ahead of us but um i think that that is powerful and i think that like we were just chatting a little bit offline about some of the recent changes and the flow and impact that they're having it seems like things are in a good place now never say never and i'm sure that a bunch more things will change but I feel like the the transparency levels are super high now, and um, basically advisors push to ensure clients are engaged, which is really what we want, I think, as a profession. So, hopefully, on the on the up from here, I'm keen though to chat about the the ethical investing space. You, you mentioned that you sort of ended up with some legacy clients in that space, but I know that today that's a really big focus for you. Can you talk us through how that journey came about and, and you know, I suppose how it progressed over time? Yeah, I think, I mean, we've, we've got an, an ad that, uh, that my wife put in a local newspaper in I think it was the year 2000 um, just talking about, hey, you can, you can actually invest in super ethically and, and talk to us to find out more. And it was, it was literally those sorts of little things, um, you know, um, being a member of the Responsible Investment Association uh, over the years, and 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 people would just search us out. People would just look us up and 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 say, yes, I don't know much about this area, um, but but tell me about it. You know, so you, you get this sort of, I guess, steady flow of clients that 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 wanted to learn more. Then what's happened over the years is that more and more super funds have introduced ethical options, and um, and and more and more advisors are familiar with it, with, with it, and there's more um, funds 
to more, more literally more investments to choose from, including ETFs that just weren't there um, 15, 20 years ago. So that's great. There's, there's a lot more options to choose from. But I guess the transition in those sort of clients for us is that a lot of them now come to us and say, look, my super fund has, I, I, I tick the box, I've got their ethical option, but I was a bit surprised to find, um, you know, these mining companies or PepsiCo or McDonald's or, you know, whatever it is that they're not particularly happy about within that ethical option. And the same, um, sometimes people come to us, look, I sought advice from my advisor, but I feel like, you know, what he or she has recommended isn't quite um, matching my ethical criteria. So, you know, can you have a look at it? Can we have a conversation about it? So we're finding we're, we're, we're getting people who are maybe a bit further along that that journey that they've they've had a crack at it and they probably haven't got the ethical overlay or the positive impact that they were looking for. And that's where they search out specialists like ourselves and um, like other XY advisors where we're part of the Ethical Advisors Cooperative um, Group. And, um, and and we certainly, um, as I say, I'm certified by the Responsible Investment Association. And, um, you know, so it's part of that 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 overlay, that, that discussion. And, you know, every conversation with a prospective client these days uh, includes a discussion about their ethical criteria. And I enjoy doing it because um, it adds to the conversation. Yeah, I think it's definitely more in sort of the mainstream view these days. Clearly, there's a lot of variation on what ethical is, but I think people are broadly aware of it. And I think talking to clients about ethical investing or socially responsible investing does allow you to build a deeper connection with them because it necessitates you getting more into their values and what is actually important to them beyond just the the dollars and the cents how did that come about for you guys though in the early days and like how did you get into the space and and what did you actually do to to build out your offer there yeah it's a good it's a good question i i just remember doing some assignments at 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 uni and when i did my mba I, i did one on on um on modern modern slavery or, or effectively child child labor and it was it was literally you know kids making soccer balls that 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 you buy you know these kids are just working you know probably six seven years old stitching soccer balls in pakistan or something like that it was just uh just just amazing i i think myself and wife had both come in with similar stories of saying yeah i want to be in the industry but i really if I'm going to be recommending investments for people, I really want them to be to be ethical, you know, up to my standards, and um, and and have some positive impact, and 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 use it as a force for good, um, and and let's see if we can change some things. And, and it's probably 20 years after that assignment. And modern slavery, like, there's more people in modern slavery now than any time in history. So there's actually a, a lot more work to be done. And, and I think that's where the positive impact comes in that whether it's um, modern slavery or climate change or other issues, you know, business as usual isn't going to get us there. And so we really believe in investment as um, uh, having the ability to, to, to make a difference and make a positive impact. And, and so literally you know, when I'm having client conversations in, in reviews or prospective clients or, um, you know, even, the, even the, the, the longest term clients that we've got, the markets might be having a terrible time, but you can still have a positive conversation about the sort of impact that that um, is being made in those portfolios, different companies. Um, you know, the green bond market is just doubling in size each year globally, and you can talk about the impact of all these projects that have been undertaken in these bond funds that have literally got got um, got got things going on all around the world. How do you practically weave it into your advice process? Like what does it look like from a client perspective for you guys? Well, I think with every client who would would do that normal discovery sort of fact find process, including risk profile questions, we just include a bit of a um, a, a basic ethical um, questionnaire in that as well with the ESNG, the environmental, social and governance uh, questions and, and, you know, find out the areas of, of, of interest for, for those clients, the areas that they'd like to avoid um, 
or, and, and, and the areas that I'd really like to support. I mean, a common one we see, I don't know if it's because we're in West Australia and maybe it's more prevalent over here, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of people come into us really want to avoid fossil fuels, but they're generally okay with other mining subject to the ethics of maybe of, of that mining company and how it's done. And, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's not saying, right, we're not doing anything extractive. I mean, a lot of people are comfortable with areas like, like lithium mining at the moment for positive impact and the fact that we're going to need that um, that lithium for for this massive demand that's um, going to be required for, for battery components. In those conversations, people will point out, you know, different things. I mean, a lot of people are environmentally focused, but occasionally you'll get someone that says, look, I'm more concerned about the social side of things. And we deal with organisations as well. So some organisations, they'll be looking for social positive Im impact and, and other ones will be... Uh, environmental positive impact so you can sort of design those portfolios around those um around those criteria. and yeah it's it's a really good way of getting to know a client is to ask what, what are the things that they that they really care about um someone might say if i don't mind investing in alcohol i'm i'm, I'm a drinker myself but tobacco is not a no-go for me i really don't like the way they advertise and um you know and someone in my family passed away from smoking or, you know, you, you just have, you get into those sort of conversations that are a bit more interesting than, hey, this is what markets have been doing and this is the market outlook and these are the different asset classes. Yeah. And how is it, how is your approach to uh, ethical investing advice? How is that, and, and your offering for your clients, like how has that shifted over time or what's changed in the years that you've been doing it? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. It really has been changed from a limited range of fund managers to really quite a wide range of fund managers. Um, obviously, the, the platforms that we use play a big part in that. Like we, we really, over the years, we, we really had to work with platforms that have got the extended menu options, not just limited menu options. Um, but these days, some of these providers just have a really, really um, open architecture and you can use managed funds, ETFs, and, and, and direct shares. So what we've done now is set up model portfolio SMAs, and um, we've we've got that in-house for ethical investment advisors um, group, our licensee. But under the ethical advisors funds management, um, we actually offer that to external advisors as well, uh, just because advisors were coming to us and saying, hey, you guys specialise in this area. I've got a few clients or, or maybe maybe a growing uh, set of clients that are interested in this area, but it's it's not what I do. Um, mm -hmm. So they sort of outsource that, um, that, that portfolio construction bit to us. And it doesn't even have to be the whole portfolio. It might be a core satellite approach or something like that. Um, but what we're doing is we've got an investment committee where we're, 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 we're managing those funds. Um, so, yeah, really... Really wide array. We're actually sport for choice. We're actually turning away a lot of um, ethical investment options these days. Um, you know, on the international shares front and the Aussie shares front, um, most commonly, and um, that's that's good. That's a good position to be in, and uh, because yeah. then we can build out the portfolio thematically, um, but also if there's literally two fund managers side by side that are constructed. Pretty similar portfolios with an ethical screen point of view. So let's say the negative screening is okay. Um, we we can actually search out the one that got that's creating the most positive impact and, and go for them. And how do you how do you go about doing that for you? Is it just a matter of doing the research on the funds or through the the actual like BDMs or managers like how do you actually practically tackle it when you're trying to choose what goes into a portfolio that you look after for clients yeah I think it's I think it's a real it's a really comprehensive blend of qualitative and quantitative because you can get that quant info and, and I guess I'd say on that quant info like we, we 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 ask for the complete stock listing of, of any fund you know the complete listing of fund holdings and there's still a few fund managers out there that aren't releasing those and we just say well we we, we couldn't use your your fund if, if we can't see exactly what's in there mm. and it doesn't have to be today's it can be it can be last month's or, or whatever 
but they've got to have that transparency. Then we've got to get to know the fund manager um, because it's about what they're going to put into that fund next week that we want to that we want to get a feel for. Otherwise, there's going to be a stock that might pop and pop up in there that we don't like, and we'll get egg on our face because we've we've invested for a client with certain criteria. We might be we might be going against that. So through our cooperative group, we do some pretty detailed product analysis, and we've got we all share these these questionnaires, um, so we can we can access that. We we get a range of, of, of research from you know, ethos and ISS and Sustainalytics and, and other groups, and then we overlay that with I guess the standard you know mainstream research that's out there and the input from 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 the BDMs and fund managers. Um, certainly, a lot of the conversations we have with those fund managers might be things like, "This fund is holding Unilever. Can you explain that? Because we're just not sure." Or even, "Look, this fund's holding Tesla at the moment. Can you explain that? Because they've had some social and governance issues. What's the rationale?" And if the fund manager can't clearly explain, I guess their knowledge of those social and governance issues and why they think the company's moving past that, then that's a bit of a red flag for us. As I said, this is why we're we're part of the cooperative group and also part of ethical investment advisors because ethical investment advisors we've got a dozen advisors to, I guess, share this work and engage with fund managers as necessary. Um, and uh, it's probably a bit too much for our, our small practice to take on all of that and deliver what we want to clients. Mm. So I was going to sure. say a bit like X Y advisor. It's a bit it's a bit of the collaborating and 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 sharing and um, you know outsourcing for that some of that info. Totally, yeah. It's hard to do it do it all yourself, especially um, you know for for any uh, sort of if you're not a big massive institution, it's um, does take a considerable amount of time. And I think the ethical piece necessitates you being more involved from an investment selection perspective. But obviously, there's a lot of different aspects of your business that also require that attention. James, what's um What's coming up for you? What are you guys focused on now and, and what's next? What we seem to be having a lot of conversations about is the impact investment space. And I guess, you know, we're talking about this, this this term positive impact and we try and create that with with listed share portfolios and bond portfolios and so on. But but also there's this whole area of wholesale investment that that really has been available for institutional clients and sophisticated investors. And I guess we're finding that we're, that's starting to be available for retail investors. And uh, so, so some of these wholesale investments, positive impact, you know, traditionally might have been solar farms or, um, you know, affordable housing, um, disability housing, you know, all, all these different areas that have been hard to access and, and might have, Time frames of up to ten years before you get liquidity. So, mm. so what we're finding now is if we can get those into the retail world, we find there is a huge demand for that sort of stuff. People really want to invest in these areas and support these areas. And um, so, it's a funny time in the industry where you've got you've got a demand that is very clear. clear excuse me, but but the uh, the products and I guess the vehicles to deliver that to 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 your average client aren't quite there yet. But we're getting there. Yeah, it's an interesting space. I think broadly um, across all investment markets, as we get more scale and more access for for investors, the the number of of choices is increasing. It obviously a good thing overall, you think, for investors, but it it also means that there's um, there's more things for us to keep our our focus on to make sure that we're across all of the things that could be could be helpful or, or could add value uh, to those client relationships as well. James, my um, my last question for you: If you could go back and do one thing differently, what would it be? I think we probably would have gone a bit harder on on specialising ethical investment, you know, in the early days. And um, you know, as I say, I think I think looking back on what we're delivering on things like corporate super or smaller clients, we we're doing a lot for some pretty pretty low fee revenue, but we were doing it for the greater good and for, for, for I guess, the, the larger corporate group. You'd see that you'd see the corporate as the as the client rather than the individual. Uh, and you'd see up to 10 or 15 clients in a day just sitting out there at a company and, and mm. uh, helping review their super. So those days are, are long gone. Um, 
regulation compliance, you know, the whole thing has been reworked. But, yeah, as I say, if, if uh, I just love those ethical investment conversations, so um, I probably would have started having them a, a bit, start specialising a bit, a bit sooner if I could have. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We were just chatting a bit offline about the 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 average cost for advice and how consumers are seeming now. They seem to understand better that it is going to cost you a few grand to get a financial plan when you get there. And um, I can't help but think it was like some of those, like you say, those corporate super funds where there there's some sort of expectation of advice at low or no cost, as well as like with some businesses where there was a focus on models where they're getting payments from sources other than what they're charging that puts people under the impression that they could, you know, pay less or pay nothing even and and still get something. But overall, I think it's definitely a, a good thing that people know that there's a cost that's attached to it and the cost is not insignificant, but that allows us to focus more, more value, more outcomes for clients, more results and then that sort of self you know that self-fulfilling that it um then leads more people into to getting advice so uh, that's right yeah i think it's a it's all heading things in the right direction and i think over the years um coming up that with the advisor numbers going down and consumer demand going up it's um there are plenty of things to keep us occupied that's for sure yeah i think i think it's a really weird time in the industry where you where a client might come to you and say, "Look, I'd like to invest and in, and uh, ethically and create some positive impact," and and you're turning away that client because they don't, you know, they don't, just don't. It's just not affordable for them. So I, I'm I'm positive as well. I'm positive that the industry will work through this and we'll have some sort of solutions about about low cost advice again for clients and maybe robo advice is part of that, but it's certainly not there yet. But but eventually there'll be some sort of solution that, that that's deliverable. Uh, and and yeah, it'll only be a good thing because it'll be more people investing ethically, um, and 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 younger clients as well. So getting younger clients in uh, at a at a low fee base, but they're just going to build their wealth over time. That's just how it all works. Yeah, and I think technology is a, a big part of that. As you say, not quite there yet, but um, getting closer day by day. So hopefully, make our our lives a little bit easier sometimes in the not too distant future. Yeah, that's it. That's it. James, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's um, yeah, great to see you kicking those goals, mate. So I, I look forward to the next conversation. No worries, Ben. Thanks a lot for the time. Cheers, team. We'll catch you next time.